a lot of land bank team members end up with properties for one, two, one thousand, twelve hundred, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah. So it's life changing, man. Yeah. It it is because people in major cities to jump into real estate in New York or in California, right? You can't get a single family home. And these are handyman specials in our cities, right? You can't get in in a good neighborhood for less than $500,000, six, $700,000. You just can't. It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. The reality for a lot of you is that investment properties where you live have become absolutely unaffordable. Here's the good thing, though. Around the country, there are so many cities with affordable investment properties, some even under 100,000, so there's a lot of opportunity out there. On September 20th, I'm starting a four-week virtual intensive workshop that'll show you how to buy your first out-of-state property. So we're gonna go over everything from creatively financing that first property, how to build your team that you can trust, how to find and analyze properties, and how to find the right location, and so much more. You deserve to build wealth for your family. You deserve to invest in real estate. It's simply a matter of getting the right information. So I want to see you there. If you're interested, go to outofstatemoney.com forward slash workshop or click the link in the description of this episode. I'll see you there. Hi, right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. If you're on YouTube, make sure you like, make sure you share, make sure you subscribe. If you're on audio, leave us that five star rating and review. Thank you so much. I look forward to hearing from you guys. Very excited for this episode today. Long time coming. Today, I have Charles Noonan out of Brooklyn with me. Charles, thank you so much. Hey, what's up, man? Welcome. How you feeling, man? I feel good. I feel yeah. good. Um, long time coming for sure. Yeah. Right? We've been kind of like following each other, yeah. low-key supporting each other, yeah. <laughs> right? And um, I got to say, that support was under the radar for a while. It's not like... Hey, you know, Sam, I'm supporting you. It was like, man, I'm going to just go buy some of his t-shirts because I think it's dope. I'm going to just watch every episode because <laughs> I'm learning from it, right? And I think it's dope. And then <clears throat> we started kind of converse, commenting on posts and stuff. You got some interesting conversations going on. <laughs> like the dialogue is serious. So then we started to have conversations and it was like, hey, man, I'm a fan of your stuff. I watch it. And I've been listening for a while. And then you're telling me you, you, you're you know, following along what I'm doing too. So yeah, long time coming, but I appreciate you having me here. Definitely, definitely. So Charles, you are like the main person I've seen online who's dove <clears throat> so deeply into the land bank and, and yep. acquiring properties in that way. So for those who don't know, what is, what is a land bank? A land bank, that's a good question too, because there's so many of them. There are 250 of them spread out across the United States. And as people get information on them, sometimes they're getting different information. So in short, a land bank is a public entity whose sole purpose is to solve the vacant pro property problem in certain communities. So they'll, as an example, They'll go into a community that has a bunch of vacant problems, vacant properties, which are deemed problem properties, and they will work with those cities to take those properties over for the purpose of putting them on back on the tax roll. So that's the benefit to the city, is to put them back on the tax roll. The benefit to the community is that it starts to solve the problems that stem from having these vacant uh, properties, right? They're, the crimes tend to happen in vacant properties. They're eyesores. They've been deemed unsafe. Yeah. And that just leads to a bunch of other issues in communities. So it's kind of like twofold for the land bank and the community itself and the city or the county itself. And then what they're able to do, which is unique, and a lot of people don't know this, <clears throat> land banks have the unique power to quiet title. So all the tax issues, any encumbrances, they have the power to kind of quiet title and eliminate those. So one of the benefits of buying land bank properties is that individuals actually get the opportunity to own the property outright. They own it immediately after buying it in some, in some instances. 
and there's no redemption period. They're very different from tax liens and tax deeds because they've gone through that process and haven't been picked up. So it kind of works twofold. It solves an issue with the city or the county, and then it solves an issue for the community. And we get the benefit as investors to where we're able to buy properties at really inexpensive rates. Yeah, I love that, man. I love that. So how does a property get to the land bank? Like what, how does it get in that kind of situation? Well, in most, in most scenarios, it's the properties that don't get purchased through the tax lien or tax deed sale. <clears throat> they'll fall into, I would say, the bucket of opportunity for a land bank. And the land bank will work with the city. And, and here's why they're so special and they're so different. Because when they're in that tax lien and tax deed space, they're not as attractive because you have to do like quiet title action. You have to wait a redemption period of sometimes up to three years in certain cities, right? In certain states or counties, um, tax deeds and liens go by counties, right? So in certain counties, you, you can buy a tax lien or a tax deed. You have to wait, th sometimes it's 365 days, sometimes it's three years. So investors don't necessarily buy those properties because you actually have to sit on it before you can do anything. You can kind of like only make necessary improvements in that space. With land bank properties uh, on the live where I was teaching this morning, we had two young ladies called the property wives <laughs> that are on the land bank team. In two weeks, they renovated their property. Um, they got it like up to code and they were waiting for the land bank compliance officers to actually release the interest and give it to them. So that's where they differ. Got it. That's dope, man. So with the land bank properties, I'm assuming is typically a lot of uh, physical distress like yep. in those properties? Yeah, lots of distress. They're, they're usually vacant. I'm going to say at a minimum five years vacant. So they've gone through that tax lien, that tax deed, the tax delinquency state from the owner, and the properties have been vacated. Wow. So you're not going to find right land bank properties in major cities that are thriving, right? New York City doesn't have a land bank um, in the five boroughs because we don't have a vacant property issue. In certain cities, and, and we'll use, let's just say like Wilmington, Delaware, um, Shelby County, uh, where else? Detroit, Michigan, where they have that vacant property issue, that's where land banks will go in and say, hey, we can help clean up this vacant property, property problem that you guys are having. Got it. That makes a lot of sense. So the idea is you buy, a, someone can buy a property through a land bank and I'm assuming as well, there's different requirements. Like you, people need to rehab it yep. and put it up to code, like you said, and up to standard within a certain time frame. Yeah. So <clears throat> one of the myths I, I definitely want to debunk with the yeah. land bank, right, is uh, so, so we were talking with another real estate investor and her, her, her initial thought or knee-jerk reaction with the land bank was, oh, they only give you six months. And every land bank, they, they have their rules and requirements based on the goals of the community, right? So every community, every county will have goals, and it goes based on what they want. Some land banks will allow anyone to come in, buy a property, and renovate it. Some land banks only want homeowners to come in and renovate. And the reason being, if you live there, you have more of a propensity to take care of your property better than if you were an investor from out of state. So when things go wrong and you live there, you're gonna fix it fairly quickly. If you're an investor, it may take a little longer. So it's typically based on the need. And then from a requirement perspective, from a time perspective, some based on the how they structure their deal with the city or their agreement, some will give you six months to renovate a property. Some will give 12, some will give 24. Some land banks, and as an example, Macon County Land Bank in Georgia, um, you buy the property and you own it outright. You get the deed right there when you buy the property. That's the Macon County uh, auction. They do it the first Tuesday of every month. Yeah. So it varies. And a lot of the myth is like, I don't want to deal with land banks. I don't want the red tape. They're going to take my house back. And where I think I carved out a niche was I don't think a government entity would want to sell a property to someone for such a low cost, have them renovate part of it, and then take it back. 
Like that just didn't sound right. So when I started to get into land banks, I really took a deep dive into the requirements. And I just started to read and read and, and just ask more questions. And I found that they really want the properties back on the tax roll. They want the properties to be thriving properties in the community, right? They want to clean up the communities. Obviously, there's a monetary side, right? They want to get the tax from it. You turn on gas, you turn on electric, um, water. So it actually does start to revive and regenerate revenue for the city, but it has so many other benefits to it. So I really started to focus there and um, just find my niche there. Definitely. I love it. I love it. So what most people are probably wondering, like, how much are we talking? How much can I get a land bank property for, depending where it's at? They vary. Yeah. Um, I would say a common starting point would be $1,000. So their land banks, I'll give you one, for example, the Detroit Land Bank. It's called buildingdetroit.org. Um, a lot of those properties are in that binder <laughs> that we see over there with all the deeds. Um, they, they have two ways that you can buy properties. One is through an auction, an auction style, which starts at 1000 And then they have this own it now process, where that own it now process, they start at 1000 and then you can like put in offers for it based on what you want. A lot of land bank team members end up with properties for one, two, one thousand, twelve hundred, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah. So it's life changing, man. Yeah. It it is because people in major cities to jump into real estate in New York or in California, right? You can't get a single family home. And these are handyman specials in our cities, right? You can't get in in a good neighborhood for less than $500,000, six, $700,000. You just can't. Yeah. So when people get wind of land bank properties and the stuff that we do on the land bank team, it's life changing for them. It's yeah. like an opportunity where they always wanted to get in, but they just didn't know how. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense, man. So I'm sure the rehab varies as well, but like, yeah. On an average, say Detroit property that could be two thousand dollars, how much, could, how much rehab could somebody expect? Well, what have you seen or experienced in your in your own experience? So for a full rehab, um, I've seen a team member spend I'm going to say about fifty thousand uh, dollars, start to finish, and they turn that house beautiful. Yeah. Right, that house is actually um, I feature it a lot. I show pictures yeah. of it. It's like one of my favorite properties, man. Yeah. This guy, and that's like almost going all out, yeah. believe it or not, because they're, what I like about them is that you can get duplexes as well, but they're moderately sized. They're like a thousand square feet, three bedroom bungalows for the most part. Then they have what they call in the Midwest, two family flats, mm -hmm. where uh, it's funny, we call them different things, right? <laughs> all over the country, but a two family, they're moderately sized. So they don't cost a whole lot to renovate. And then what we also have to consider the cost of labor in underdeveloped cities is a lot less than what you and I would spend on renovating a kitchen in, uh, in Brooklyn, yeah. right? Or in one of the more uh, expensive parts of California, it would be that somebody might do a kitchen for 50000 whereas in some of these cities like Wilmington, Delaware, Michigan, you can probably do a whole, you can easily do a whole house for 50000 um, some of these locations also, and, I've, and they've been done as low as 20000 uh, which we see for full renovation. Some of these locations have um, warehouses where you can buy used doors, windows, cabinets. Like I've seen someone get a whole cabinet set for like $800 installed. Wow. Cabinets, countertop, uh, everything. So yeah. some of those are the resources that we share yeah. to members on the land bank team. Definitely, definitely. That's that's dope. So what made you want to get into the land bank? Because if I understand, if I remember correctly, you started investing in New York City. Yeah. And then you decided to venture out after a while. Yeah, so so my story I'm gonna say is a little bit different. It was it really was focused on my kids, right? So just investing in New York, I was doing well and gentrification started to get crazy, right? 
the house that I live in now, $500,000 regular brownstone, right? Location, downtown Brooklyn. And then what I started to notice was neighbors in my area that were just moving in started reporting they're spending $750. The Barclays Center comes, now they're like $1.2. Um, Downtown Brooklyn starts to just revive itself and, and gentrification starts to get heavy. The same brownstones on, on the area that I live in, two million, two point five million dollars. So here's here's like my thought process, right? So I have two sons. I'm like, they're very similar to me, right? They're going to college, athletic scholarships, but not scholars, right? So I'm starting to think. When these guys graduate college and it's time for them to live somewhere, right, to move out on their own or whatever, they're not going to be able to afford a $2 million home or 2.5. Like the average American can't necessarily, even with a bachelor's degree, afford a $2.5 million home. Who knows what it's going to be like when the youngest graduates, right? So I just decided to take it upon myself so that they wouldn't have to compete so hard. And I decided I'm gonna just go cash out on some properties and build them portfolios, right? And I was just figuring I'm just gonna go buy the cheapest properties for the purpose of a debt-free door so that they could start to have monthly income coming in every month um, and just build like one for the, the youngest, one for the old, right? And just build so that when they graduate, at least they'll have $7,500 a month, $9,000 a month coming in so that they don't have to go crazy trying to afford heavy mortgages. They could actually keep some of their check when they, when they get it. And, you know, New York City is just starting to change to where for the upcoming, for the next generation, there's no way they'll make it if they started at zero, yeah. right? It's just too competitive. All the other cultures, everyone else is, is, passing down these head starts for their kids so that when they graduate college, it, it's, it's a lot more seamless instead of a struggle. So that's why I found the land bank, um, land bank properties at a thousand. So now I'm like, all right, this is great, right? Mission accomplished. I'm just going to buy 10 of them each. And by the time they graduate, they'll each have 10 properties. And um, boy, Concept and theory versus reality hit me, right? So trying to develop in different cities, like from, from a distance, managing a portfolio here in New York, a life, right? A family, everything else. And then trying to do that in another, in another city, which is almost another world, right? The Midwest and the East and the North, they're all different, um, became a challenge for me. So the mission, that was the mission where I got started and going through the struggle and learning how to operate in different cities and learning like the laws, the culture is extremely different. And then I just started to document all this stuff. I started to document the journey um, after every loss, right? So my why in investing is different than everybody, than a lot of people's, right? It's like, I have to do this for my kids, or they're gonna move to right somewhere where they could afford whatever a thousand, two thousand dollars, right? And it was like, nah, like we're close, really close knit family. So it was like I just couldn't give up. So after losses, right? Like I had break-ins, I got contractors stealing materials, uh, stealing supplies, windows missing. Um, those losses, like there was no way to get, there was no giving up. So I just had to get smarter and smarter where I had to buy camera systems. Um, I found like these solar powered camera systems where I could actually talk and hear what's going on in the property. So that was a big help. Um, the credit cards that have loss and theft protection, of course, so after more loss, right? <laughs> after paying contractors and more loss, I start to figure it out. I'm like, all right, so materials and things don't get stolen. We got cameras. For contractors showing up, contractor accountability is huge. Anywhere in America, 
it's that accountability factor. Either you're going to go stand on top of them and make sure they do the work, or you're going to trust them and hope that they do it. And then you got to drive to your property to make sure that they actually did it and quality and QC their work. But the camera systems um, changed the game for me. I had one at one time eight cameras on, on one property. Wow. And it was like me standing over them, right? Because I could put a camera right here and see that they did the bathroom, right? And see the work that was being done. And now I could pay them. So after those losses, man, it made me such a conscious, safe um, investor and developer to where for some weird reason, I didn't know what was coming. <laughs> I started to document all of this stuff. And then um, that's where I started, man. I just yeah. got my start in the Midwest. I got up to 34 doors wow. in the Midwest. Um, everything from a block of single family properties to a commercial unit of 16, uh, 16 doors. And the journey continues. I love that, man. About how many um, landing properties do you have now? Land bank in total, 34. Got gotcha. you. Properties in, t in total, like the, we have our book of deeds over there, 353 deeds to properties in total. All debt free, by the way. Wow. And I know you have like a bunch of land. Is it down in Alabama? Yep. So we have Alabama and Mississippi. Alabama and Mississippi. Yeah. Primarily, primarily Alabama. And I, and I got a lot of that strategy from just fully entrenching myself into real estate developing, um, surrounding myself with developers, surrounding myself with people that are big in the insurance industry, surrounding myself with the banks, right? All the developers, you have to go in pricing your deals, right? And they're, so, they're all concept at this point, but you have to go to the bank to, to get it funded. You have to, in those proposals, figure what insurance is going to be. So the insurance agents and brokers know where all the like big time developers are going. They know where the Amazons are going. They know where the Whole Foods are going. They know where the biggest developers that are going to build skyscrapers are going because they have to come to them to get quotes. So I started hearing a lot about um, Alabama, about Birmingham, about Jefferson County, Bessemer County. And it was like, all right, through the work that I did in other cities, they introduced me to land bank personnel there. Wow. And I was able to get in very early and like buy tons and tons of properties there. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so the land bank is like properties, but also land as well? Yeah. Wow. They'll sell yeah. land and properties. It's the same process. Same thing? Okay. It's, it's very similar processes yeah. too to where some of it is application, some of it is auction. However they sell land, however they sell the properties, they probably have the same, most of the time it's the same process for land. Got it, that makes, that makes a lot of sense, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what are some different exit strategies that someone can do with, with the land bank property? So like you rehab it and then you can rent it out, but are there other things people can do with yeah, land bank properties? Of course. Of course. And here's another thing too that people don't really don't know or like they struggle with understanding and then sometimes like you said they get very practical or basic information on the sites and you just have to do some digging. So there's pretty much four strategies that we that we go over on the land bank team. Um, one of them is fairly new uh, and it just it, it, it's, it's funny that you get introduced to these concepts through practical real life situations where we're starting to figure out different exit strategies. So here's a quick strategy where people can make some fast money with the land bank, right? You buy the property, they all have requirements for you to own the property outright. You can do the minimal requirements and you could sell that property to a wholesaler and you could like, so I've done that strategy where I've done the minimal and sold a property. Uh, let's just say you bought a property for $1,000. Yeah. Let's say $2,000. You put in, let's just say, to do the minimal requirements, $4,000. So you're in $6,000 on the property. You could sell that property to a wholesaler anywhere from $18,000, $30,000. Um, I've executed on that strategy. However, you know, so, so you knowing me, 
my my goal is different. My goal is like to build generational wealth, create create wealth and not debt. So I don't love that strategy. It's the least um, exercise strategy on the land bank team. What I've noticed for strategy number two, so we'll say that strategy one. Strategy number two, what we notice is that some of the land banks, and if you really pay, pay close attention to it, they have what's called rehabbed and ready properties. So they are rehabbing a subset of properties themselves, and they're selling those properties $150,000, $200,000, right? Um, let's just say, the, uh, for example, the Detroit Land Bank, again, they have a section called Rehabbed and Ready. They're taking the same properties that we're renovating, they're renovating them, and they're selling them. So strategy two would be like a full renovation and sell it on, through like a realtor or like an MLS or something yeah. uh, to that nature, Wh however you want to sell it, basically. But it's to do like, be like a flipper. Yeah. Strategy number three, we call the generational wealth strategy. When I first started, a lot of my branding was um, create generational wealth, not debt, right? And it was like the debt was crossed out. And that was just because we, at some point, have to start thinking about passing down our portfolios. So that was the whole concept. It was like debt-free everything if we can. Um, so that strategy is to buy, renovate, and rent out. It's to buy and hold strategy. And it's to build those portfolios. But what makes the, the, the portfolio different is that it's debt-free. So however you got the money, and this is one of the things that I really teach and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty strong with my students about, however you got the money to renovate, do everything you can with all the rent money that you collect to pay that debt off. So sometimes students would use like a debt-free, like an interest-free credit card. Uh, some of those companies give like 12 months, 24 months yeah. debt-free. I mean, interest-free. Yeah. So I teach that strategy um, if you use the bank, whatever it is, just sacrifice is what I teach. Like right? sacrifice, take all the money, take every bit of rent money, and just pay it off. You will see the light. You will. But what I don't want happening is I don't want banks or any other institution having hooks in your property where they could take it away, yeah. right? Because that defeats the whole purpose. You lost your time, your work, your money, your energy, yeah. your time away from home. Right, you you've lost like the dream of passing down this portfolio. So strategy number three is like my best strategy. It's like the, the strategy that I I want everybody to get to. I'll take strategy one, I'll take strategy two, but if you bought a property and you spent fifty and you sold it for one fifty or one seventy five, like that means it was worth one hundred seventy five thousand dollars that you just let out of the family name, right? Yeah. Like I'd rather you just hold on to it, rent it out, and cash flow it that way. And then, um, just by the laws of nature, what we talked about this morning in our, our mentorship call, um, seller financing is for us being a bank and us doing seller financing. We're doing it from a portfolio perspective. So for those that want to generate passive income, right, they have, I teach in different levels, right? So there's like beginner stage, intermediate, and pro, right? The beginner stage is getting so smart. They're learning how to buy two and three properties at one time, <laughs> right? So they're learning how to buy two or three properties at one time. And they're able to sell them seller finance. And what that's doing is creating that gener it's generating that income every month to where they're now collecting $900 a month for you know, four or five properties over yeah. the course of two, three years. And it, it's, it's a strategy where, again, I don't love it because it, it removes the ownership piece. Mm -hmm. However, it also removes like the downside of having tenants and the struggle with tenants too, right? Yeah. So now we know where to buy properties really inexpensively, right? Eventually it'll run out. I don't know because America has a huge uh, vacant property issue. Yeah. Um, it will run out. It, they will run out, but I don't know how long it'll take. Yeah. So that strategy, it's not my favorite, but I get it yeah. because some people don't want to be landlords. Some people don't love tenants trashing your, your, your house um, the phone calls you may get at night, right? If you got two, three properties, you might not have a, um, a management company. Yeah. 
So now you're fielding those calls about the, the leak in the roof, the clogged toilet that you find that has like a whole wad of paper towels in it. And so I think what's starting to happen is it's becoming more and more popular, this um, seller finance, because we know where to get the inventory, right, at a really inexpensive rate. For someone that wants to get into real estate uh, from a buy and hold perspective, it still makes sense for them yeah. to pay $700 a month seller financing. Mm -hmm. You renovate the property, you can rent it for twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500. You make money and you, you're paying the bank back, so to speak. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So for someone who's uh, considering the land bank, what are like maybe two or three land banks you tell them just to check out first? All right. Uh, that's a tough question because yeah. I can be biased to a You can be biased. It's bank, fine. Right? And um, when I meet other ones, <laughs> right, they, they say I'm pushing and promoting. But I'll say one of the biggest land banks is the Detroit Land Bank. Um, it's called, it, you can find it, buildingdetroit.org is the actual website. And that's like the quick hitter. That's like the overnight success site. You can go there now, you can buy a property in like whatever time, like four hours, you can actually own a property from the Detroit Land Bank. Uh, one of my other favorites is the Wilmington Land Bank, uh, Wilmington, Delaware. It's it's reasonable drive from New York. I think it's like two and a half hours I get I got there before. Um, the Wilmington Land Bank has a very unique program. It's called their Homestead Program, where you have to agree to live in the property for, I think it's three years or five years. However, you do an application, you do, a, uh, you do an application, you show proof of funds. If you qualify for their program, they'll sell you a property for a dollar. Oh. One dollar. Yeah. Wilmington, uh, Delaware's Land Bank. Y'all heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do a, oh, so they have different programs too. So there's a $2,000 program. We'll sell you a house for $2,000. Um, you just have to agree to sell it to an individual that's going to live there. And again, if you just re remember, think back to the community goals, they really want owners living in certain communities because owners tend to take care of their properties better than investors or out-of-state investors. And then um, I have to mention this one, man. This is the last one that I'm going to give. You said three. The Birmingham Land Bank. Birmingham. And, and I, I do own property there. So I'm promoting it, but kind of, sort of, not really because I own so much there, so I'm welcoming everybody to come invest there, right? It's just gonna appreciate my kids' portfolio. But the Birmingham, Birmingham Land Bank Authority, man, um, I had a student there, he quit his job off of buying and renovating properties from the Birmingham Land Bank. Uh, he was a, post, a postal worker, post office worker. He bought a property, um, renovated it, they spent like sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars on renovations. Sold it for one eighty-five. Quit his job the next day. Wow! So it's a process. Um, there's a little wait waiting period, probably um, somewhere between sixty to ninety on getting the results of your application back. But um, once you do it, and here's the thing with the land bank: once you renovate a property there, right, in any of the land banks. You're now what's known as like a trusted investor. Yeah. So they know you, they get to see your work, they'll highlight you if you do a really good job. And then they almost open the books to where they invite you to now do it again and do more. Yeah. So um, my client, my, my, my team member, Ken, I think he's at like five or six right now, but just completely quit his job, man. We experienced some technical difficulties with the video recording of this episode. So if you want to hear the rest, head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, search Black Real Estate Dialogue, and you'll find it. If you want to keep up with Charles, follow him on Instagram at Charles J. Noonan. And also check out his YouTube channel, The Land Bank Show. See you soon. What's up, y'all? Sam here from the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Thank you so much for watching another episode definitely take a moment to subscribe. Make sure you like this video. Also visit our website, blackrealestatedialogue.com and follow on Instagram at blackrealestatedialogue.
Talk to you soon.